And just like a snowball rolling downhill, ketamine's PR nightmare has grown bigger and bigger over time. But it's not just limited to the state of Colorado. It's now found its way into Minnesota, South Carolina, as well as other states. And it's not just a matter of dosage errors. There was an article that came out in a newspaper a couple of years ago that was examining the use of ketamine by EMS providers and the interaction between law enforcement and EMS in these cases, which was perceived as being inappropriate, where law enforcement officers were asking EMS if they would give the patient ketamine. But think about this, perception is reality. Um, and I want you to look at some of these excerpts, some quotes directly from this newspaper article where the, uh, the media had been looking into this use of ketamine by EMS and the directions sometimes being given by law enforcement. And they looked at all kinds of body camera footage. And this is the stuff that they presented to the public. One thing they talked about was how um, a, one patient was given ketamine even though he was, quote, already in physical restraints. The inference being a patient who's in physical restraints who gets ketamine, well, that's just overkill. He's already restrained. Why do you need to sedate him? So that's what the media is presenting here. Now, we know with uh, situations like excited delirium that a patient who is already physically restrained still has an ongoing life threat unless they receive something like ketamine to uh, relax their system so they are not fighting those physical restraints and increasing their risk of sudden cardiac um, collapse. But the media, the public, they don't know that. So all they saw was someone who was already physically restrained and helpless being given a sedative medication on top of that. They also looked at the police department's uh, memos and, uh, and policies and how they viewed ketamine. And what they found was where it discussed and defined ketamine as a recreational hallucinogenic drug known as Special K. As we said, it's been used as a recreational illicit drug in the past. Uh, there was another point where they had body cam footage of a paramedic who had just given his patient ketamine saying kind of flippantly, patient just hit the K-hole, throwing out that slang. Uh, the police department records also referred to ketamine as a date rape drug. So all of these things combined paint the picture that ketamine does not have a place in emergency medical services because it's a date rape drug. It's, it's a hallucinogenic. Um, we're using it to penalize, punish people after they've already been restrained. So ask yourself, is that a win or a loss in the court of public opinion? One final word about Elijah McClain before we move on. Um, there was a civil suit and the family was awarded $15 million uh, after suing the city of Aurora, Colorado over the death of their son. But the story, as we know, is far from over. As I said, there have now been manslaughter and criminally negligent homicide charges filed against those officers and paramedics. So let's summarize what we've discovered so far. What are some of the underlying factors in the present ketamine controversy? I think that these are the big three. First of all, the obvious, dosage errors. Secondly, the role confusion. What I mean by that is EMS and law enforcement blurring the lines between them and making their way into domains where they don't belong. Uh, law enforcement obviously trying to um, suggest or ask EMS to give a person ketamine before EMS has a chance to even do their own assessment. And situations where EMS providers may get confused and think if a patient is aggressive, they obviously need ketamine. But is it truly a medical emergency or is it just simply to subdue a suspect? Using ketamine simply to subdue someone is not legal. That is not our job. We are not in the, the uh, business of taking custody. We provide patient care. Is that patient care just to try and control someone's behavior? Or do they have a medical emergency that necessitates the use of a chemical restraint? 
Those are the things that we need to really be taking a hard look at as time moves forward. And then lastly, the big problem was public perception and uh, the providers involved not being cognizant of the fact that this day and age, you're probably being video recorded by someone. Um, so we have to always assume that a camera is rolling and watch our words because even though we may mean nothing harmful by the things we say, and this is a field where sometimes our stress, as you know, we have kind of a rough sense of humor at times to try and cope with some of the things that we see on a regular basis. But we have to be uh, aware of the fact that the public, your average Joe Smith down there, does not have that experience. And they're going to perceive things from their own biases, their own background and point of, of perspective. So what have we learned from all of this? Well, I think the biggest takeaway point is to do your own patient assessment. Never substitute someone else's judgment for your own. That's a huge mistake, whether it is a police officer asking you to administer a drug or even another healthcare provider, no matter who it is. If you are gonna be the one giving an intervention, giving a treatment, giving a drug, you must do your own patient assessment beforehand. Otherwise, you run the risk of ending up with a negligence lawsuit. Use care when estimating body weight and calculating dosages. These massive overdoses of ketamine, they seem like very common sense when you look at it and say this dosage should never been given in the first place. Now, what led to this mistake? It's hard to say. But this is one of the reasons why in the state of Colorado they made it law that before giving one of these drugs, two providers must agree upon an estimated body weight for the patient. And I think that's very reasonable. It goes right along with the concept of the medication administration cross-check and just doing your due diligence to make sure that you are doing what is in the patient's best interest. Lower doses of ketamine are being shown in research to be just as effective as some of these higher dosages. Now, I'm not going to uh, refer to SCAD's current dosage of ketamine. You need to consult your guidelines for that, current guidelines, because sure enough, as soon as I finish recording this video, there's gonna be something happen and the guideline dosage may change. So to keep this video relevant for the future, I'm not quoting SCAD's dosage. So what you see here on the screen is not necessarily what SCAD guidelines dictate. Refer to the guidelines. And there will be a question in the quiz uh, that addresses that uh, directly. The Richmond Agitation Sedation Scale. This is also included in our guidelines, so refer to this. And do not sedate someone below the level of a negative two. Any more than that, and it becomes dangerous. It gets out of the, the, uh, the realm of chemical sedation uh, and chemical restraint into anesthesia, and you want to stay away from that. Get the patient off the ground and supine or in the semi-fowler's position quickly. If the patient's been subdued by law enforcement is being held prone on the ground, as soon as it is safe to do so, Maybe you, you give them the ketamine after doing your assessment and the patient is adequately sedated enough to where it is safe enough to move them to the stretcher. Do so as soon as possible. Vital signs need to be taken immediately after administering ketamine. Anytime you chemically or even physically restrain a patient, you must assess vital signs right away, including in tidal CO2, pulse oximetry, and the patient's ECG. And remain always in a position in the ambulance where you can monitor for signs of respiratory decline, any kind of distress, and make sure you stay ahead of the game. Reassess them frequently, at least every five minutes. And be prepared for advanced airway intervention. While the risks with ketamine are relatively low compared to most other uh, drugs used to chemically restrain patients, it's still a drug and the risks still exist. So be prepared for the worst case scenario. Prepare for the worst and hope for the best. And finally, watch your attitude. Be aware of how your words and actions may be interpreted by those around you. 
always assume there is a camera running somewhere nearby.